How is uh, life in your neck of the woods? It sounds like you are quite a busy person. <laughs> I am. I am indeed. Yes, all all is good. I'm based out of um, Boston, Massachusetts, and uh, it's kind of warming up a little bit, which is kind of nice. Um, took a nice outdoor walk today. And um, nice. yeah, overall, I think everything's been going well, just being busy with my full-time job as well as um, um, just all the side stuff that's going on. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it was, it's kind of obvious because you're writer on the side or author on the side, right? But I didn't realize that you had like a full-time job and this was <laughs> what you do in your spare time. I don't know how I didn't put two and two together, um, <laughs> but it's funny how that works. Again, we'll just, uh, you know, we'll chat for a few minutes until we get a few more people in the room and then we'll do some more official introductions and we'll kick things off. So, um, but yeah, what is it that you do? during the day like what's your job so i worked for cisco systems uh the tech company oh nice uh yeah i'm um director of the pmo or program management office so i kind of oversee a team of project and program managers in um in the americas so the u.s canada and latin america and um yeah it's it's a fun job i mean cisco is a fantastic company to work for i always say this even when we get to the introductions that you know views are my own and not those of cisco that's part of uh having a full-time job and doing side gigs at the same time uh but it's a fantastic Absolutely. company to uh to work for it's just been voted like best company to work for i think three years in a row now probably more so holy cow yeah that's yeah. amazing Kind of cool. Well, that's super cool. Yeah. And you've definitely, you know, you figured out how to create on the side. That's for sure. Like you, uh, you own and, and define that moniker that you've got there for yourself. Thank you. So it's yeah. super impressive. I've only known you maybe for what, six or eight months uh, and found you here on Twitter and then, you know, went through the archives of your podcast and stuff. And I was just like, oh my gosh. I think it was because you wrote that piece on uh, NFTs for authors. Yes. I, I remember that. That was where I, uh, initially discovered you that's probably that's right that's fall. right you reminded me yeah absolutely we we connected uh over that i think you had some some questions about that even though technically i'm not i'm no expert i just kind of dove in a little bit spent spent a few mm -hmm. hours understanding the space but um but yes i remember clearly now that that we connected over twitter and that specific uh, um article that i published yeah, it was a great yeah. piece. I still reference it every once in a while. <laughs> As I'm now that. like gearing up for a book launch and gearing up for, you know, new courses and thinking through how do NFTs and Web3 play into all that. That was a, a lot of helpful information. So um, why don't we kick things off from there? And yeah, uh, it's always funny when people pop in and out and they're like, oh, they're just chatting. <laughs> it's like, we just started, man. <laughs> all right. I'm letting it all go, though. So here we go. Um, this is the second now Craftsman Creative Workshop here on Twitter Spaces. Uh, it was an idea that I had just, you know, as I'm gearing up for a book launch uh, to try to meet more people and chat with more people and try to, uh, you know, share with my audience some of the people that I admire and look up to here on Twitter that I've met over the last year or so. And so we're chatting. Uh, we've got Hassan Os Osman or Osman. It's Osman. Yep. Osman. Either works. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate you correcting me, though. So Hassan is someone that's extremely talented as a writer, as a creator, um, has a full-time job. So he does a lot of this on the side, hence his uh, handle. And I'm really, really excited to have this conversation because one thing we both share is an affinity of creating courses. So you've managed to, uh, I don't know what the timeline is here, Hassan, but you've done, it says nine courses and you've reached now 200,000 students. I need to actually go and pull that up and put it in the nest because you're, um, <laughs> you know, you're, uh, that's a pretty incredible staggering number. So tell me a little bit about your history as a creator, how you got into doing courses and then we can kind of kick things off from there. Yeah, sounds good. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Darren, for the invite. This is cool. Like, I'm really excited about your book launch and uh, what you're doing here with with other creators. I look forward to listening in to some of the other uh, spaces you host and, and the podcast episode. So let me kick this off. I know we kind of, you know, when, when we just started here a few minutes ago, I kind of gave a quick intro. But in case we cut that off and start, start fresh. Um, <laughs> 
so my name is Hassan Osman. My I have a full full time job. I'm an employee at Cisco Systems, um, the tech company, because sometimes people mix that up with the food company, uh, SYCO. <laughs> um, yeah, so sometimes when I say I work for Cisco, they'd be like, "Yeah, I always see our trucks uh, all around." It's like, no, not not that Cisco. <laughs> um, and I basically lead a program management team uh, in the Americas. And by the way, given that I am a creator on the side, so that's sort of my day job. Um, I always have to kind of caveat it with the fact that views are my own and not those of my employer. Mm -hmm. And then um, I'm an author and creator on the side. So I've, for many, many years, uh, published books and courses while working a full-time job. And uh, that's been a passion of mine. It's sort of my cash flow positive hobby, if you will. So I really enjoy uh, writing books as well as uh, courses. I also have a podcast. And um, basically, I have I started with courses back in 2013, actually. So the end of 2013 was the first time I, I published a course. It was about managing virtual teams and how to kind of um, influence and, and motivate the team that you don't see. This was way before it was popular, obviously, due to COVID. And since then, it's been course after course. Um, and my platform of choice, which I'm sure we're going to be talking about a little bit more here, is Udemy. So Udemy mm -hmm. has been the platform that I published on back in 2013. And I've published nine courses so far. And as you kindly mentioned, you know, hit, hit 200,000 students not too long ago, which is still a crazy number for me. It's and, staggering. Um, it's amazing. We're going to dive into that a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, and, and I'm excited to talk about that. And um, yeah, so, you know, here I am. I, I have now uh, a blog called Writer on the Side. It's also a, 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 a podcast, I should say, and um, kind of talk about creating while working a full-time job. Amazing. All right, well, let's dive in then, because I just want to kind of get right to the nitty gritty. I call these workshops because I don't want it to just be two or three people that are on stage talking uh, philosophically about a topic. I want this to be pretty hands on, share kind of your thought process, your workflows, your frameworks, the principles that you operate by, all those great things. So let's dive in and talk about courses and we'll kind of ping pong back and forth because I've got some a very different way, it sounds like, of creating them and marketing them and different platform. And so we have a breadth of experience here. Mm -hmm. So let's first talk about what's the right time to start, to start thinking about creating a course. Where in the, the lifespan of a creator should they, or do, in your opinion, should they start thinking about creating a course and putting it out there to reach more people? Yeah, great question. I think... Um... The best way to answer that is um, to say that the best time to start thinking about creating a course is yesterday. And I say that tongue in cheek, but I really think that every creator out there uh, should seriously consider publishing a course for many reasons. Uh, one of them being the fact that it's a fantastic asset that not only brings you in uh, revenue, right? Obviously, it's a, it's a money generator. Uh, but it's also a higher priced uh, asset, if you will, or digital asset compared to others like ebooks or or worksheets or or what have you, right? So usually there's a there's sort sort of this price anchoring with courses that's a little bit higher than um, any other digital product. So I recommend you know that for for that being one reason. Another, and this is really important, is that I think. You know, if there's something called the pyramid of communication, which kind of shows you the, the different levels of or different technologies you use to communicate with people. At the bottom of the pyramid is email, which is the most boring, asynchronous type of communication. A step above that is like instant messaging. Above that is audio uh, or, you know, phone conversation. A step above that is video. And then finally, you get face to face communication. And the higher up the pyramid you are, then the more intimate and, and sort of close you feel to this person you're, you're communicating with. And then the lower you are on the pyramid of communication, the less intimate it is, right? So, and, and this is a perfect example, Darren, like this is the first time you and I are on a call and we get to hear each other talk, right? So you kind of build that mm -hmm. relationship that's a step above just tweeting or direct messaging. 
Um, with courses, it takes it above le- a, a notch above that where you get to see someone, um, you know, on video and, and their mannerisms and the way they interact and, and the way they teach. And so that gives you a little bit of that uh, one-to-one or really one-to-many connection with someone who purchases your course that you can't achieve in a book, right? And so I always say, you know, write books because they're business cards on steroids to kind of help you. Well, with mm-hmm. courses, it actually amplifies that because th- it, there's so many opportunities that you can get from publishing a course. I'll give you one example. Um, you know, someone took my, one of my courses on Udemy and they thought that I would make a great speaker for one of their conferences. And the only way they could make a determination without having to sort of interview me or go through any, um, you know, any process was because they saw exactly how I'm going to present. Like they saw the final product. They saw my style. They, they liked the way I talked apparently. And so they invited me for that without going through any additional filter process. So think about that and the potential opportunities that you can um, open up for you as a creator if you do, um, if you do publish a course. Amazing. There's a lot that we could dig into there, but I want to quickly share um, my answer to that same question, the right time to start thinking about creating a course, because I kind of have an interesting uh, storyline or relationship with online courses. I did two of my own right at the beginning of the pandemic in April and May of 2020. So I started this business called Craft and Creative, and I was like, I'm just going to make some courses because I got furloughed from a TV show that I was a producer on. I found myself finally for the first time in a decade with some free time. And I was like, (laughs) I've always wanted to do this because I go to lunch with my creative friends and we talk about business and stuff. I'm like, this would be great. So I made two courses and quickly realized that a, not a lot of people were spending money in March and April of 2020. Everyone was a little bit freaking out. And uh, second that I didn't have a big enough audience or enough affinity with my current audience to sell lots of courses. Um, you know, if you look at me now, I'm on Twitter and I have like 1400 followers, which to me is amazing. But to, uh, when you're seeing it in context of like the online education world, I have a pretty small following, same with my email list, et cetera. But, uh, what I realized at the time was like, okay, well, let me test this theory out. Does it really matter? Does the audience size matter? And I went to a friend who's also here in Provo, Utah, where I live, but she had about 11,000 followers on Instagram at the time. She's a hand lettering artist. So I said, hey, have you ever thought about doing a course? And she said, oh my gosh, I've always wanted to do a course. I just don't know how to do the editing and the post-production and the website and the payments and all that stuff. I'm like, well, look, I just created the entire platform and the payments and the website and all that stuff. Why don't I produce your course? And then you put it up on my site and I'll help manage it for you. And we'll just split the revenue 50-50 on the back end. She said, great. And a month later, we had her site, her course live on the site, and she did 10 grand in sales in her first week. Wow. So I have these two very clear things that support my idea that like, you should be thinking about a course as early as you possibly can, because the process of thinking about a course means that you're thinking about how to create value for other people and how to help other people get what they want, get certain outcomes and results. So If you're not quite there, if you're not quite there with your ability to teach or your audience size or the way that your audience sees you as an educator, at the very least, thinking about it and going through those motions is going to help you become a better course creator. But I have seen multiple times now I've I've done 15 courses for this site, Craftsman Creative, and I've seen it over and over again. Um, Audience size matters to a point. So if you you want to have ideally enough of an audience to like support the course and give you the kind of rent revenue goals that you want, but if you I've done courses with massive audiences, three and a half million followers, five hundred thousand followers who have sold ne- next to zero because their audience didn't actually see them as someone that they wanted to learn something from. So I'm right. curious, like when you hear all that, my experience with courses, what are some of your thoughts? What does that make you kind of? Like, what should you do about that if you're listening to my story? <laughs> yeah, you know, so much to un- unpack there. First of all, that's great. Uh, I mean, with, with those numbers in the first week. And um, listen, I think an audience always helps. I think there's always a, an opportunity to leverage uh, a, a good following, especially an engaged following. 
in uh, providing additional value. Because if you already have an, you know, X number of followers, then you're, you're adding value in one way or another, right? Uh, you know, assuming they're not your like cousins and family members and close friends, if you mm-hmm. have strangers following you, then there's probably something that clicked with them that you're adding value uh, on. And there's always that potential to monetize that uh, in one way or another. Now, there is a, there's always that chance that you might make a mistake on what you would assume that they'd pay for versus what they would actually pay for, right? So I have some friends who've got like uh, tens and tens of thousands of followers, but their audience, for example, is 18 to 21 year olds, right? Like mainly college Mm -hmm. students. And those are usually, they, you know, they're very frugal usually, you know, you want to be careful about how much money you spend. So, you know, putting a $300 product out there for them to buy um, that doesn't really hit the buttons on on needs, you're not going to be able to sell it, right? Um, on the flip side, you can also, if you really target a very small uh, community and you absolutely nail the requirement or a pain point um, or a problem that you want to solve for them, then it is very, very feasible for you to be able to sell uh, a, a, a course uh, without the huge audience. And I'm going to give you, you know, I'm going to be transparent and give you some good examples here. Um, awesome. So I'm actually launching my first cohort based course. It starts on Monday, by the way, um, called Create and Sell an Online Course on the Side. Uh, this is being sold on Gumroad. And, um, you know, it, it, I, you know, Daniel Vassallo, right? I think mm-hmm. you, you're aware of him. So yeah. Daniel, I'm part of his small bets community on, on his Discord. And the, the idea of the course started there. And I kind of just sort of asked a lot of people asking me questions about you. I mean, I was like, well, maybe I'll start the course and, and launch it. And, um, you know, came up with a sales page. I gave a short webinar to Daniel's group. That was a sort of a close community. Maybe 35 people attended. I think a lot more registered for it, but only 35 attended. And at the end of that webinar, it was an hour or so. Um, I kind of said, hey, I'm, I'm launching a course and, you know, it starts in a couple of weeks. If you're interested, I'll give you a special discount because this is through, uh, you know, Daniel's community. And 10 people signed, signed up to the course um, before it ended. And then maybe like three or four the next day after they watched the recording. So and that was enough for me to kind of justify actually doing it right. Like I'm talking 35 people on a webinar. So that's not a huge or crazy number. Um, so it is, you know, just kind of giving you my thoughts, Darren, on, on your experience. I think audience always matters, but what really matters is the content, uh, of the course itself and, and what you're actually, uh, solving as a problem for that particular audience. Amazing. We covered in that a couple other questions I had, and I want to go about 10 more minutes where it's you and I just asked, answering a couple of these questions, but then I definitely want to open up the floor for anyone who's listening who would like to ask questions about the process yeah. of creating courses. Um, so my next question then, I, I didn't send you ahead of time, but I'd love to just hear what your process looks like. So you, you know, it sounds like you're using the audience as a way to discover and surface topics that you could potentially talk about, but then what do you do from there? Do you, you know, are you thinking through like a big long outline? Are you spending months or weeks figuring out what the content and the order in this, you know, bullet point by bullet point? Like, how do you map it yeah. out? What's the filming look like? And then kind of what's the post production, meaning edit, are you editing these courses? Like, what's the process look like to get them up on the platform? I know that's a lot, it's kind of a three in one question, but I'd love to just hear <laughs> your entire process how you how you go through this because it's obviously a successful endeavor you wouldn't have done nine now uh, another one coming up so this will be your 10th course and two hundred thousand students it's obviously working so show us kind of the behind the scenes here yeah i'm happy to well first of all let me clarify that this course that i'm uh, conducting live my my cohort based course is my first cohort based course i've never done a Mm -hmm. cohort based course before um and the reason why I'm, I'm clarifying that is because all my other nine courses uh, have been pre-recorded courses on Udemy. So totally different process. This just right. happened to pop up because of, you know, Daniel was actually giving a push and saying, hey, there's a lot of interest in this. You, you got to go for it and let's see, 
how it works. So that's how I went with, with my cohort-based course. For my other courses, I do not rely on audiences at all. Like I barely, um, like out of those 200,000 students, maybe, and I'm guessing maybe 100, 150, not 150,000, 150 total uh, came through me, came through me, them knowing about me and I send them a link and they sign up to my course. Wow. The 199,000, whatever, um, number came through organically from Udemy, right? So, and this is what my cohort-based course is going to be about. It's teaching people how to publish on Udemy specifically. So this is a good question with a good time because I'm actually, you know, going to be talking about that in the course. The way I, here's my process and feel free to cut me off because I know you, you know, there's four in one questions there to unravel. <laughs> um, and I, by the way, I'd love to hear your feedback too on how you do it. So maybe you can go back and forth on, you know, feel free to interject and let me know your thoughts. Um, basically what I do is step one is I come up with a course topic and title, right? I think that's the biggest um, sort of factor in whether a course makes it or not. I think if you really know or hit a point uh, with a course to topic um, and a title that resonates, then you're on your way to probably creating a uh, successful course, right? And the framework mm -hmm. that I have is is really very simple. Um, you know, I, I think of it as three circles. There's interest, experience, and market, and those three circles intersect in the middle. Um, let's let's break those down. Interest. I choose something I'm interested in, right? It doesn't have to be something I'm super passionate about, but if I'm not interested in it, it you know, I'm not going to enjoy talking about it for a few hours and I'm not going to enjoy talking about it if the course is successful on webinars or whatever, right? So it's really important to pick that. This one's easy. The second circle is about experience. So you want to pick a topic that you have some experience um, in, in the subject matter, right? Credibility is important, right, on, on Udemy. You don't have to be an expert, meaning you don't have to have a PhD or a Pulitzer in a, in a particular topic. You just need to know more than the average person and be able to kind of prove that publicly, right? So the first is interest, something you're interested in. The second is experience. The third, most important, is market. You want to make sure that there's a market for that topic. There's an active buy-sell sort of uh, process going on uh, where people have a need for this particular topic, right? And there are a few ways which we can talk about here today about how you can validate or, or know a little bit about the, the, the market and how to research it. But if you pick a topic that intersects all those three circles, something you're interested in, something you have experience in, and something that has a, an active buy-sell market in, then you're picking a topic that is um, going to hopefully be successful in, 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 in terms of a need, right? Now, that, those are mandatory to me. Like, it has to be something I'm interested in, has to be something I'm, I have some experience in, and does have, have to have some sort of a market related to it. There are two or three other optional criteria, but highly recommended. The first is pick something that is related to your job, or your business. So if you're a freelancer or entrepreneur, pick something that's related tangentially to your, uh, to your business uh, or your full-time job if, if you have one. And the reason why is because you'll get the benefits of cross-promoting, right? Or, or sort of cross-branding, if you will. So if you create a course, if you're an accountant and you create a course about accounting, that's going to help you uh, elevate your status within your job or your company, or even potentially get invited to give talks about um, something related to, you know, accounting best practices, right? So it kind of helps that you're establishing expertise in that area. Um, the second is think about potentially uh, coming up with an evergreen topic. And the reason why, and again, you don't have to, but evergreen topics will help you in the long run because you won't have to constantly update them, right? So with, with particularly technology topics, let's say you wanna do a course about Instagram best practices. I mean, the, the interface changes every once in a while, the, the rules change. And so if you're talking about Instagram, social media, best practices, maybe every two, three months when Instagram has a major update, 
you need to kind of go back and change some of that course content. Otherwise it becomes stale very quickly. Right. Right. So, so that's sort of the high level framework that I think about. And then there's obviously taking it a couple of notches down. One thing before I turn it back to you is on the market aspect of things, um, Udemy has a very powerful tool. It's a free tool called Marketplace Insights. And literally, you go on that tool and you punch in a topic and it gives you a, a high-level overview of how much money you can potentially make if you publish a course about that topic, as well as trending analysis, keyword analysis, and other related um, course topics that could also potentially be um, in demand, right? So it gives you co competition. It says, you know, the competition is low on this, but the demand is high. That's a great, great potential topic for you to kind of jump on. And it gives you the average monthly revenue as well as the highest um, revenue producing course number as well, right? So, so that tool is invaluable. And whenever I come up with a new course topic, I go through this entire framework plus the Market Insights tool. Wow. Okay. I'm going to check that out because I haven't heard of that before. <laughs> so I'm going to quickly share a completely different approach to making courses. So first of all, um, Craftsman Creative is its own platform. You could call it a very small competitor to Udemy because Udemy has, is a platform where anyone can upload their courses to the site and it's a marketplace for buying courses. Craftsman Creative, on the other hand, is not a marketplace in the sense that anyone can upload or sell their own stuff. It's very curated. And I produce or my team produces all of the courses on the site. And so it's uh, not something where people are turning it around in a weekend or a couple of weeks and then uploading it, um, just something recorded on their computer, which isn't to say anything bad about that process or that approach. But we really took the, the model of like um, Masterclass or Monthly or some of the other sites that are popping up right now. Um, you know, really high production value, really thoughtful course structure and outlines and things like that. And so what I look at as the, the owner of the company and the producer of the courses is demand. So when I have someone say they're an influencer, they've got 20, 30, 40,000 followers on some social network and they come to me and they say, hey, I, you know, I saw my friend was doing a course on your thing and said it went really well. I want to do a course. The first thing I do before I even ask them about how many followers and what's your engagement and yada, yada, is I say, great, go and ask your audience what they want to learn from you. And I monitor it. You know, I follow them on Instagram or on Twitter or wherever they might be. And I, I make sure that I, you know, have notifications turned on for the week or two that we're chatting and I watch and I see what happens. And then I ask them to give me kind of a report back. So one of two things happens. Well, I guess, the third thing is that they don't do it and I don't work with them, but <laughs> I've had, these are the two things that have happened. One, I had a guy named Terrence who's a hand lettering artist and a graffiti artist who I was going to have do a course with. He had about 19,000 followers on Instagram. And so I said, yeah, just reach out to your audience and say, Hey, what would you want to learn about what I do? And he got six responses and he came back to me and he said, you know, that was really eye opening. I realized that my audience doesn't see me as an educator. So hmm. let, he, he did this himself. He said, let me take about six or eight months to really like once or twice a week teach something on my platform so that people start seeing me as an educator that they would want to learn from. And we're still chatting. We're still talking. And maybe this summer or this fall, we will we'll go and produce a course together. But it was a very easy way to, to see that there wasn't any demand when it came to a course yeah. from that creator. Now, on the other side, I've had people who um, message their audience who had a smaller following, you know, say 8,500 or 9,000 followers also on Instagram in this case. She messaged her audience, put up a story in like a Q&A or a poll or whatever they call them and asked her audience, what would you want to learn from me about what I do? Because she's a calligrapher and an engraver and a hand lettering artist and does all this stuff. And over a hundred people in one day responded with very specific, I want to learn how to do this. I want to learn how you do this. Tell me about this part of your business. Tell me about this tool. Tell me about this process. And she basically was given hand delivered from her audience, an entire outline of all of the things that her audience wanted to learn from her on this topic. So it was really easy to say, yeah, let's do a course together because I'm investing 
time right. and money and equipment and all of this stuff to produce a course for people. I want to make sure it's going to be successful. And she's already had over a hundred people sign up for like the email list, the, the pre-launch emails will open up. We just were filming last week in Canada with her and another artist up there in Toronto. And it was amazing because both of them went through this process, asked their audience and they, their audience came back and said, yes, we absolutely want to learn from you. So that's the approach I take with the courses and then I've also done it for myself. So as I mentioned earlier, early on in the conversation, I have a book coming out next month. Well, I'm also going to release a course along with it that supports the book because there's always people who read a book and who want to go deeper and want to have a little bit more hands-on or a little bit more context or understanding. So I'll put a course together, but I didn't even think about the course until people started asking, hey, do you have a course about this? <laughs> and even with my small audience, you know, my email list is about 1500 people. My Twitter following is about 1500 people. You know, my, my threshold is a lot lower. I'm not looking for hundreds of responses, but if I get a dozen people asking the same question or showing demand of, around a course or an idea or a product, that's enough signal for me to go, Oh, I should be thinking about this because that's pretty impressive uh, from my small audience. So there's two ways you can approach it. I love your framework. I think it's really, really smart for people who are thinking about a course that's maybe a few hours on a single topic and a single outcome. Really, really smart framework uh, to look at interest and then experience and then the market and doing some of that research. I'm actually going to incorporate some of that market research into future courses that I'm producing because it's so smart to do. Yeah, and in a way, you're, you're. and by the way, I don't know if it's me or... Um, like my connection, you were breaking up a little bit. I don't know if someone who's listening can can confirm if uh, if they were hearing you break up a little bit. Hopefully, it's just me because that way, because I could make out what you were saying, but I just wanted to kind of put that out there. Um, Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, it's okay. It might be it might be my connection. By the way, am I breaking up at all? Or no, you've okay? been you've been perfectly clear. Okay, great. So um, you you touch on an interesting point and that is you're you're kind of doing market research too right like the fact that people you're asking people what is some of the their you know their needs or what specifically they'd like a course about or what topic and in the case of your friend you got an outline that's amazing right like that that shortcuts so much because you're tailoring um a, a course for someone who asked for it um and you know one of the things i kind of talk about is that you've got objective methods. So you look at Udemy's Marketplace Insights, for example, or Google Trends or the keyword tool. Um, you know, there's many uh, sort of objective ways of looking at, at market research, but you've also got subjective methods. And one of them is, is just keep listening to what questions people usually ask you, right? Particularly if you, 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 know, you have vertical expertise in a particular domain, what are some of the common themes that people ask you over and over? I mean, that is definitely ripe for a potential course, uh, or it could be a scratch your own itch type of thing, right? So mainly, um, if you have any sort of, um, you know, problems that you that bother you and you you've sort of solved them for yourself, you can almost guarantee that other people have that particular problem or challenge as well, and maybe creating a a course around that could potentially help. Um, having said that, though, it is very, very important to know that validation is never or almost never guaranteed, right? And I'll give you an example of that. Same thing with this cohort-based course that I'm launching in a few days. When I came up with this idea in this Discord community, um, I was saying, hey, should I do a course about Udemy or should I do a course about just side hustles in general? And someone responded back saying, if you do a course about Udemy and, and what you've done, I'll buy it right now. Like literally I'll <laughs> buy it right now. And I was like, great, I have my first sale, right? So I go and create the landing page and she doesn't buy. And she actually, she's, she's super nice. She even connected with me later on and she said, well, by the way, yeah, I didn't buy because of X, Y, and Z, but I'm a perfect example of um, you know, this, this sort of testing the market that you know, there, there has to be another trigger. It, you know, it, it was whether on price or, or something didn't click or the timing, there's so many factors that come into play. So I think it's also very important to always manage your expectations with that, that people can tell you, yes, this is exactly what I want. This is what was going to you know, solve world hunger for me. But then when it comes to actually buy, 
or even if you give it to them for free, they might not even sign up. So there is there is that element uh, of it too. So you have to always be careful about expectations. However, getting that signal is better than no signal, right? So that's also right. <laughs> uh, something to, you know, I don't want to dismiss it completely, but it's just taking it with a grain of salt as opposed to uh, gospel, uh, as some people do. Yeah, the validation thing is something I know Daniel Vassal has talked about too in the past. And it's it's not a binary thing, either you have validation or you don't. It's very much a spectrum. And every product is going to be different and every experience is going to be different. Every customer is going to be different in their reasons for wanting to uh, say they want to buy it or actually purchase it. So uh, mm -hmm. before we keep going, because I do have more questions for you, but I want to open it up and see you know, if anyone here in the space has any questions, especially burning questions for Hassan or myself about creating courses. If you're working on a course and you've got something that you want to like ask about and get our input on. Uh, that's what really this is for. So feel free to raise your hand or I'm actually not sure how it works in Twitter spaces, but maybe you do one <laughs> of those emoji things a couple of times and I'll see you and I'll uh, allow you to do that. So I'll invite you up on stage and you can uh, be a speaker and ask some questions. So you can do that anytime. I'll, uh, I'll find you if that happens. Um, but letting you know that now's the time to be thinking about questions. Um, yeah. But in the meantime, as we're waiting for that, so Let's dive into the process. So um, I'll give you the 30 second version of mine because it's not super exciting. Um, and it's also, uh, frankly, quite prohibitive because I'm talking about two cinema cameras, a bunch of lenses, lights, sound, a full edit suite, um, an entire website platform that I use, uh, Thinkific. So there's this whole big process that I've built out, which arguably is not smart for a solo creator to have so much overhead and to have uh, such uh, a robust uh, process for this. But my process is pretty straightforward in that I work with a creator. I set up a time. We go and film for one or two days. I've got two cameras rolling at all times, sometimes three and maybe a screen recording. Then I go into an edit. That takes about a week or two to do the edit. And then it's like, uploading it to the website and making sure the back end looks good and the it's organized right and I'm adding text and I'm adding links and I'm adding downloads and it's pretty it's a lot which is why the courses on my site run from like $129 all the way up to $1000 with the average being about $400 price point mm -hmm. so that said and I you know I'm happy to go deeper on that if anyone in the room has questions but I definitely want to hear about your process and also why you made the decision. Maybe you touched on it a little bit, but, you know, to price them the way you did, because some you're even discounting 80 or 90 percent, whereas they were, you know, they show a price of one hundred twenty dollars or so, but you're charging 20. So I'd love to hear about the actual process of what does it look like to create a course? How hard or easy is it and how have you optimized it to be able to generate so many like you've done? Yeah. Um, yeah, happy to walk through that process. And again, just a reminder, if you have, if anyone listening has any questions, feel free. I think you can raise your hand or something and we'll, we'll invite you to, to ask a question and you can unmute, I believe. Um, so, and by the way, fascinating there and what you do, right? Because you're, you're touching on a different market. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, immediately I'm thinking masterclass. I know you kind of brought that up as a, as a, mm -hmm. as an example. And, um, there's definitely a market for that compared to what, you know, the, the courses are on are Udemy. The way I think about it, though, is because I'm a solopreneur, right? Like I'm, I'm, I'm alone. Uh, I don't have a support system. I don't have a lot of time. I've got, you know, my full-time job. I've got a full-time family. I don't want to spend a lot of time on marketing. My approach was the 80-20 rule, right? Meaning I can't be a perfectionist, even though I am a perfectionist myself. <laughs> and I have to kind of let go of some of the things that I would rather have improved. Um, kind of just let them slide and move on. So I optimized for that, right? Meaning um, what I do is, for example, is I, I have a lot of focus on screencasts as opposed to um, talking head videos, right? So a lot of them are just me on a PowerPoint and kind of talking through them and, and, and describing. And, and the subject matter of the courses that I teach is perfect for that, right? Because they're more about management, how to manage people, how to lead and that sort of thing. Um, and then just for the, a couple of videos for the introduction, as well as for the promo video, the, the promotional video. So Udemy has 
on their landing page for every course, a one to two minute slot or a video that you can use as a promotional video. That I usually spend a little bit of time and effort on creating a, you know, a little bit of a professional one, right? I mean, nowhere near what you probably produce with, with multiple shot cameras and the fact that you've got a, you know, a lot of experience in the, in the production industry. With me, it's just a couple of lights. I use my webcam. I use my AT2020 uh, microphone. And then I have a backdrop um, with, a, with a backlight shining just to kind of give it some space. And then I just sort of use a teleprompter and kind of look through the, um, uh, you know, read through the script and kind of have some B-rolls over that, right? So nothing too crazy um, for those promotional videos, add a little bit of background music too. Uh, but that's, that's really it. All of the rest of it is very basic screencasts. Uh, I sometimes have a picture in picture, like you can see my face sometimes in those uh, videos as well. But other than that, it's, it's sort of, you know, in terms of editing and equipment, um, you know, everything I've spent is probably not more than three or 400 bucks between the webcam and the, and the, and the um, podcast and even the backdrop and, and all of that, right? So nothing too crazy or professional uh, at that level. And I do have corporate clients. Like most of my um, students that take my courses are part of what's called the Udemy business pool. So the way Udemy works is you, as a user, you can buy courses in one of two ways. You either go on udemy.com, search for a course, let's say yoga, and then you buy it. It's 15 bucks. And then you have lifetime access to it. And you can watch it anytime you want on your laptop or on your iPhone. Um, that's, that's one way. Another way is if you are an employee of a company, your company basically spends you know, X thousands of dollars a year, and it gives all its employees access to a subset of Udemy courses called Udemy Business, right? And this is a curated list of maybe 7,000 courses now that um, you as an employee have access to um, that entire collection without paying a cent for them, right? Your company already pays a subscription model. So my courses sell more through the Udemy Business uh, collection than the Udemy marketplace is what they call it, or the organic, just any one individual uh, person can, can buy a course. So given that my clientele, quote unquote, are more business organizations or employees at business organizations, um, that has been okay. Like meaning the level of production value hasn't hurt me, or at least that I know of, uh, even though it is a business oriented um, customer, right? So there's so much we can talk about, but that's sort of it at a, at a high level. Awesome. When I will say, despite my propensity for like <laughs> overindulging on production value, my core belief is that the content matters more than anything else. So yeah. it might have pristine sound and an incredible looking image. But if the content sucks, <laughs> if, <laughs> if it's bland, if it's boring, if it's hard to watch, if it doesn't make sense, if there's no complete thoughts, um, it, it's not going to work. And I've had people I've, in, let's see, I've, I've got about 650 students on the site, meaning that's 650 people that have purchased a course from me um, through Crafts and Creative. And I've had one return in that entire wow. two years time. Because I, I, I obsess over making sure that we are, I, I do a similar thing to what you do, which is interesting. And I think important to note that like the course topic and the title is the biggest, uh, most important. That's a factor where the, whether the course is going to be successful or not. And what I try to do in all of the course titles is explicitly say what the outcome is. If you purchase yeah. this course, this is the outcome that you will have after six or eight hours of watching through it. And that way it's very clear and it helps the decision-making process of the person who's sitting there going, I've never been on this site before. I've never heard of this person before, but I definitely want this outcome. So I'll give it a try. And I think it's helped a ton in the fact that we have such a low return rate and such a high completion rate. It's something like 85 or 86% right now. The students that are buying the courses, A, it helps that they have such an affinity for the the people that created the course, they're already fans. They already have years of context of being a follower of theirs, but the courses are 
like we spend up to an entire month going through the outline for the course and refining it and honing it in and making sure that there are complete thoughts all over the place. And that, you know, if it's lesson 4B, that it reinforces the module that we're in and that it reinforces the topic, which is the promise that we're making to the student. So if the promise is, you know, learn how to do a 20 minute makeup look, which I have a course on makeup, believe it or not, um, <laughs> then every single lesson has to reinforce and support that outcome. We can't just go off and talk about, you know, our kids for a little while or, yes. you know, philosophy or religion, like everything has to make sense and support the outcome so that when people are maybe feeling a little bit lost or a little bit, um, confused wherever they're at in the course, they at least know that it's going to pay off at some point because the lesson that they're in out of 30 lessons is going to make sense if they keep going. So that has been extremely helpful for me and the course partners I work with ensuring that we really dial in on the outcome first, which informs the title and the marketing and the, the approach to the outline. And then we spend a lot of time outlining to make sure that we cover everything we need to cover for the student to get the outcome that we're promising. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. I mean, even um, part of my, my course instruction is that before you even um, come up with the title of your course or start building it, you have to complete an output statement. And that output statement is, my course will help blank, blank. And the first blank is audience, and the second blank is outcome. So Amazing. if you don't know exactly <laughs> who your audience is, narrow it down, right? And what the outcome you want them to achieve, then it's too early for you to start building the course. You got to really nail that down. And yeah, that, that should be your North Star in the whole process. You definitely want to keep it as concise and as tight as possible to deliver on that outcome for your audience. Perfect. So we got, you know, 10 or 15 minutes left. Um, I want to be respectful of your time and not go all night long. But um, if anyone listening does have questions, now's a great time to raise your hand and I'll bring you up as a speaker. And so you can ask that question. Um, and if we don't have questions, that's also OK. But the two th other questions I had for you specifically, Asan, is as I look through your Udemy profile and your success there, um, I would love to know how you think about pricing. And I would love to know how on earth are you getting 5,000, 9,000, 4,000 reviews of these courses? <laughs> is that something Udemy is helping you with? Or are you somehow, you know, this one up top, bestseller, 43,000 reviews. It's a four and a half star review. So whoever voted it, you know, low, it's like, you know, karma is a bee. So like, <laughs> whoever gave you bad reviews, shame on them. But all of your courses are extremely highly rated. And you're, you're in the tens of thousands of reviews. So tell me about reviews. Tell me about pricing. Yeah. Um, so let's start with pricing, right? Um, first of all, the way Udemy's pricing works is based on something called tiers, right? So you can price your course between uh, anywhere between $19.99 to $199.99. So basically between 20 bucks and, and 200 bucks. And, and, you know, 19.99 is tier one, and then uh, 199.99 is tier 37. So there's 37 tiers. It goes by $5 increments, right? So it starts at 19.99. The second price point you can choose is 24.99, then 29.99, and so on and so forth, right? Um, the reason why they do this tiering is because it's a global company and you've got different um, currencies around the world. And they want to sort of match the equivalent, but not go too crazy on, on the U.S. dollar conversion, right? So you'll see, for example, that, um, you know, if you price your course at the lowest tier, which is 1999, it's 1999 U.S. dollars. But then in Canada, it's 2499. Um, mm. In Europe, it's 1999 euros. And in, in the UK is 1999 pounds. So they kind of do the, a little bit of price adjustment for that tier, right? Now, you basically, after you price your course, um, have an option, and I'll, and I'll kind of go back to answering you on how I price my courses after I give you this overview. 
um, you have an option. There's two optional pro promotional programs within Udemy. One is the Udemy business program, which I, which we just discussed, which is the corporate plan. You need to opt in for that. And if you get selected, your courses become part of that pool. Another is called the Udemy deals program. Again, this is an optional program. So not anyone can has to join it. But what it does is it enables Udemy to offer uh, courses at a compelling discount. So it actually could go lower than $19.99. So they could price it at $9.99, for example, or $12.99. Um, and basically, they do the whole targeted promotions for you. They do list price optimization. And most importantly, they uh, do localization using economic factors. So, for example, someone who lives in India, um, you know, cost of living there is is uh, different than than it is in the U.S. Uh, purchasing power and so on and so forth. So they do this whole price parity where you, if you're living in India, you're going to get the courses for a lot cheaper uh, than if you were in the U.S. Right. Um, mm -hmm. That is an optional program that I've signed up to with every single one of my courses. Um, and what wow. that does to me is it almost doesn't matter what I price my course at. Like if I price it at 39 bucks or if I price it at 180 bucks, it is going to be sold for like 12.99 anyway, <laughs> because, <laughs> because Udemy does this um, sort of price optimization for you. And it's, it, it sort of goes through those motions. You've got a huge team, you've got data analytics and it kind of, it's sort of like first, degree price discrimination in a way <laughs> i don't think it's that crazy but but it does it does a lot of that right so because it doesn't matter to me like i usually create a course and you know if it's an hour long i'd put it at maybe 39 bucks if it's like 45 minutes long it's just maybe 25 dollars. if it's three hours which is one of my courses i actually have it at, at 180 bucks but mm -hmm. that doesn't translate to any sort of meaningful um, piece of data that I can use in terms of changing the price. I tried changing it a couple of times, maybe over the years. It doesn't matter because <laughs> it's, it's going it, to, Udemy is going to control that price for you anyway. Right. So wow. um, not a lot of people know this by the way, but yeah, I, it's it, unless I opt out to the program, then probably I'll have different, you know, I'll have a different story for you, right. That I can, if I change the price, I get more sales or whatever. Um, but yeah, so, so the reason why I got 200,000 plus students across my nine courses is precisely because of those two programs, the Udemy business, as well as the Udemy deals program. I don't think if I did, I, if I opted out of those, I would have made, um, made that, you know, that many students or had as many students sign up. Now, um, to answer your next question about ratings. Udemy incentivizes ratings a lot more than um, Amazon. So, you, you, you know, if, if you have a lot of people that take your course, it, it actually interrupts you in the first 10 minutes and says, how are you liking this course so far? So you kind of have to, kind of, you know, give a rating um, <laughs> out of five before you continue. And then at the Smart. end, yeah, they pester you a little bit. And then I also have, you know, Udemy has automated messages. So as soon as someone signs up, you can have an email that goes out to them. And then as soon as they end the course, it tracks, obviously, the percentage of the course completion. So when they're done with the course, you can have another automated message that goes out. Both those messages, I'm kind of begging people to leave a review. <laughs> like in the first message, hey, welcome to the course. I hope you find it helpful. Or you're going to learn the following. And oh, by the way, Udemy really, you know, cares a lot about ratings and reviews. So please leave an honest review if you find this helpful. And then at the end, I kind of beg them again. <laughs> um, yeah. And I, I think that helps. So I think, you know, just the automated system. If anyone ever, you know, emails me or in the system or, or reaches out, I kind of just say, hey, by the way, if, you know, I'm glad you like the course. If you didn't leave a review, it will really help if you do. So I think a combination of all of that has, uh, has really helped, um, you know, between the Udemy incentivization as well as me using the automated messages and the follow-up. Smart. Yeah, it seems like they are doing everything they can to make it as frictionless as possible. Because I even yeah. go on the site, you know, I, I popped back to a different tab and popped back and they're like, hey, everything's now $6 even cheaper. So all your, <laughs> all of your courses are showing up at thirteen ninety nine, dollars um, And it seems like as I was just browsing through the site and prep for this, like everything, no matter what people have priced it for, 
everything on the homepage, everything on like the different topics pages are like $20 is kind of the average yeah. price. Yeah. So, which, you know, totally is valid. And the results show for themselves, right? 200,000 students. Um, it's pretty impressive. Whereas I can speak to 650 students over two years with 15 different courses. So I have more courses at a higher price point and I'm guaranteeing that you've made more money on your courses than I have. So everything's a trade-off, right? Of course. Um, Super interesting. Um, Absolutely. So, you know, in in respect to time, I would love to see if anyone has questions. I don't want to just have us talk the whole time if anyone has uh, been holding on to their question this whole conversation, but thank you all for being here. Hassan, I'd love to know if there's anything that you're currently working on or promoting uh, anywhere people can go to learn more about you and the work you're doing. Uh, where do you send people these days? Yeah, thanks so much for asking, Darren. Uh, so I, you can find me on writerontheside.com. That's sort of my main uh, site where I have uh, my podcast episodes uh, listed on there as well as my latest projects. Uh, right now, I'm definitely focused on this cohort-based course that's starting on Monday. Uh, after that, I might have a version of the course that's going to be recorded. I'm not mm-hmm. exactly sure yet. I mean, we'll we'll see what happens. Uh, I might do another cohort uh, after that. Like, I'm still, it's still too early for me. I want to go through the the, the whole experience first. Um, but yeah, and and you can find you know if you're interested in the course, you can check out writeronthesite.com at the top banner there. There's more info about signing up and and what I'm going to be covering. So um, this has been a pleasure, by the way, Darren. Thank you so much. And I'm I'm you know I'm looking forward to checking out some of your courses too i don't think i've, I've got the opportunity yet um maybe at one point we can work together because i think there's a lot of different opportunities it's not just you know udemy but um also kind of capturing a different demographic or a different market so uh Absolutely. keep on the great work yeah that's it that's an instant yes for me because i've been so <laughs> impressed with everything you've been putting out the last six months or so i've known you um, so I'll just put two quick plugs in first, since we're talking about courses here, uh, you can check out all the courses that I've been talking about and referring to. If you go to craftsmancreative.co, that's the website that has, you know, it's currently 13 live on the site. I just filmed two more last week in Canada and those will be up live next month. And, uh, the big thing that I'm pointing everyone to is just follow me on Twitter at Darren T Smith, D A R E N T S M I T H. And, there are you know, two or three links that are associated with my profile. So you can look at the book uh, that I wrote back in the fall and will be coming out next month. Um, you can actually read it for free because I wrote it in public, meaning I posted and shared each chapter as I wrote them. And it was an experiment to see if I could grow an audience basically from scratch. And now I've, you know, 500 people later, um, it's been a, a wildly successful experiment. So uh, the book hasn't even launched yet, and I've already cleared $50,000 in revenue from consulting clients, from coaching work, from early access membership signups, all of that, that I've just been doing sneakily in the background without even telling anybody. Nice. Um, so r- when you say a, bi- a book is a business card on steroids, it's 100% true. And I would say the same thing for courses. Um and what I would recommend is there's, you know, the link there in my profile, it will take you straight to kind of a book summary, a one page book summary with um, just information on how to build a six figure business. That's kind of my mission right now is to help creators who have been at it for a while. Maybe they've been creating as a freelancer, a contractor or an employee for three, five, 10 years uh, and want to do it full time and make a living doing it, but they don't know how yet. Well, that's what all of my my book, my course, the community that I'm launching, everything is there to support that outcome of helping creators make a living doing what they love. So again, thank you for taking your time and being so willing to do it at short notice as well. Um, But this has been amazing. I really look forward to hearing from people and what their questions are and their feedback. And hopefully please check out Hassan's work um, because his podcast is amazing. His books are awesome. His courses look you know, very easy to purchase because they just deliver on the promise. Everything is there. So Hassan, thank you. Thank you all for listening. And uh, we'll wrap it up there, I think, unless you've got anything else. No, thank you so much. I'll make sure to include a lot of the um, links to your, to your book and, and to your website on the show notes uh, of the podcast episode as well. That way, hopefully we'll get you some, uh, some additional exposure. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone for listening and have a great night. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.